Wonderful, huh? Praise the Lord. Let's go to Romans 13 where we left off last time. Romans chapter 13 beginning with verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. It was really strange. I listened to the testimonies this morning. Some of the testimonies were coming right down the trail of these verses and yet the people doing this didn't know what I was going to speak on this morning at all. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit ties the whole thing together and makes it fit. Have you ever watched in amazement as I have at Hegwish how the Lord ties the whole thing together? How the songs, the testimonies, and the message will all just be running right down the middle of the track. And uh, you can always feel the flow of which way the Holy Spirit's going. And it's just really amazing uh, what God can do when you just give him half a chance. And we're such imperfect vessels, but even then, when you just give him a little opportunity, what a blessing he can pour out on us. Owe no man anything. This is a thing that has been consistently ignored in our society and has led to absolute disaster, and we're hanging on the brink of disaster right now. And you say, well, how can you be happy if you think the nation is about ready to crash? Because Jesus is in good shape. So is God. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong in my father's house. It's down here where the problems are, and he has given us weapons of warfare to battle and to set people free, to set ourselves free, and to set others free, and to get them on their feet that no matter what happens, whether we crash or prosper, we're going to be better off for walking with Jesus. Can't lose. You know, it's, it's heads we win and tails the devil loses. And when you've got that kind of philosophy, you just, you're like a cork. You can be pushed under, but you don't stay under. You know why? You know, you take a cork bobbing around in a tub of water and you put pressure on that cork and it'll go right to the bottom. You just hold it and you say, there, there, now you're fixed. Now you'll never get up. You'll never get up. That cork, you'd say, yeah, that's right. That weight is so heavy, it's holding it right under. But you know, if that cork can ever wiggle out from under that weight, what's going to happen? It'll go boom, right up to the top. Here I am again. Because, you know, the cork has built into it air spaces that makes it lighter. And the only time it stays under is when it's under pressure. That's the way believers are. You're built to come on, up on top. If you're under, it's because of pressure. Now, the way to do it is find out how to get out from under the pressure. And God's made ways, hasn't he? Praise the Lord. You say, do you know them all? Oh, no. We're learning, though. We're slow learners, but what little we've learned helps a lot of people. Did you know that literally thousands of people have gone free because of what God has shown this tiny little church? Now, you notice what I said, because of what God has shown this tiny church. Winworthy didn't show anybody anything. But God has done it all. What he has shown to us, we've translated into print and onto tapes, and it's gone across the country and around the world, just like the prophecy said it would, which was impossible to believe when this church was 25 members and God was talking about shaking the nation. It didn't seem, wow, that's ridiculous. How could that be? And God kept saying, don't despise the day of small things. And I said, well, Lord, I'm trying. You know, but it sure did look despicable to me. I mean, you know, a teeny little speck, you know. Even a great big church would have a hard time shaking the nation. But I didn't know what God was going to do. You didn't know. And I still don't know all he's got in mind because he probably had probably frightened me out of my socks if I knew. I mean, if he, if he told us half what he's going to do, we'd be so scared we wouldn't walk. Wouldn't we? Think about what you've been through. If God had lifted up and said, now here's what's going to happen a year from now, you say, whoa, back up. Now, I can't handle that. Of course, you didn't see all the preparation God's going to fix so you'd be ready for it time it got there. So God in wisdom doesn't show us a whole lot. We can't handle all that. We don't have to. But I'll tell you one thing, we can handle, and that's step by step with Jesus. Can't we? And just keep walking with Jesus, and don't you let him hold you under. Come on, cork, pop back up to the top. Amen? Owe no man anything. Get out of debt. You say, but I'm head over heels. Well, then start getting your head back in the other direction. Heels on the bottom where they belong, your head on top. Start working at it. You'd be surprised how quickly you can get out of debt if you start working at it. Oh, you won't live as high. But debt is the thing that is a, is a cruel taskmaster. And all the advertising is slanted. You deserve it. Just charge. 
Did you ever uh, just charge it and charge it and charge it and then at the end of the month you said, Ah! I can't believe this. I only charged a few things and look, I don't believe this bill. Don't they mount up fast? It's so easy. Oh, easy payment plan. Easy credit. Easy to get, hard to pay for. Hmm? Start working your way out. And if you have to have indebtedness, have it on a couple of big items like a car or house that you can't get everything together for. But everything else, start, start getting out and doing without. Start garage sailing. You'd be surprised what good things are over there. <laughs> Daniel, are you doing this to me? The devil doesn't want you out of debt either. See, debt is a cruel taskmaster. And if you're in debt, then you're going to have problems, problems, problems. I'll go to the wireless, all right. All right, I'm on the wireless now. Strangely, how strange that it would break off right there. I'm telling you people, get out of debt. This church is out of debt. This church hasn't been in debt since five years ago when we bought the building and we had to borrow uh, forty-eight dollars or $50,000. I've forgotten which it was. Forty-three, something like that. And that was paid for in six months, and what a relief. Some of you have never been in a church building that was paid for. Walk all over these floors. They're paid for. Sit on those seats. Say, <clears throat> oh, they sit better than the kind that are mortgaged to the, for 25 years, huh? Did you know most churches have no possibility of ever being paid off? Did you know that when the economic crash comes, whenever it's going to be, the pinch comes, most of these churches are going to be padlocked, not necessarily by legal action, except they're just repossessed because they don't have the money to make the payments. This is one that will stay open unless they shut us down for preaching the truth. And that's entirely possible. But we'll be fighting when we go down. And if they scatter us, we'll take the truth with us wherever we go. Amen? Amen. That's the orders, you see. We don't have any orders to pull our flags down just to change preaching points. If if we have to. Did you ever did you ever drop a ball of mercury? Hmm? It just runs in every direction, doesn't it? You wish you hadn't dropped it. Did you know that when the devil came against the church, early church, it was just like a a little beaker full of mercury, and he said, "Good, I've got them all here together. I'll just crush them right now." Did you know that when he hit the church a lick, it was just like quicksilver, it just ran in every direction, and it got out of hand, and it's still out of hand. And, oh, he's he pretty well corralled it and got it pretty boxed up pretty good, but the deliverance sweep now is coming, and that's completely out of control. Demons have told me for several years, they've said, Whirly, we know what the other bunches are going to do. These other Christians, these great ministries, they're no big problems, so they're predictable. I said, we even know what they're going to do. Well, I'm really static here today. Uh, said, we even know what they're going to do. But said, you stupid deliverance people, said, we never know what to expect out of you next. I find that refreshing. That the enemy has some things that bother him. You know, he's bothered me with a lot of things. Hasn't he bothered you? Well, if you'll become a deliverance worker and fighter then you'll be under direct orders from God and he won't be able to predict which way you're going to strike next because your orders will come from headquarters and he doesn't have any access to those plans. <laughs> the first he knows about those plans is when he feels the whack across his forces. I just find it so uh, amusing because the devil lays out a trail, you know, and he's got the course of this world laid out just like he wants it, heading it right straight to destruction, economic, political, religious, spiritual. Everything is pointed to destroy, destroy, destroy. And he's got everybody marching lockstep across there, you know, 
And then here comes a little column of deliverance workers just cut right across that course and just break it all to pieces, tear up his supply lines and wreck everything. And he's got to, oh, what happened? What happened? I don't know. That crazy idiot bunch went marching across there and they just came binding and loosing and tore up everything. And they've got to go back to the drawing board. We've got to re reroute this whole thing. Uh, they've torn up the supply lines. They've cut off the messenger service. They've, uh, they've bound up the principality. They've dumped them off their thrones in the heavenlies. Everything's all in a mess. What happened? Well, you know those idiots. You can't predict what they're going to do. They have direct lines. You know, they, they, they tie them to us directly. And you know there's no defense against those angels. Praise the Lord. Send them after your enemies. Mm -hmm. The principalities and powers that are directing the destruction of our nation are the same ones that are after the church, the same ones that are directing the government where they're putting pressure and harassing the churches and God's people. Mm -hmm. Those are the same powers, so we're entitled to attack them with the same forces of spiritual power. Owe oh, no man anything. Get out of debt the, to the best of your ability. Because I tell you, everything you've got that's tied up in paper, you say, oh, I've got my money in a bank. Oh, my. You heard about Continental's fate here. What was it, seventh or ninth largest bank in the country? The first nine banks in the country are, are bankrupt anyway. That's including Rockefellers. They're bankrupt. Do you know how they've kept going, the banks? You know how the banks have kept going, those big banks? You say they can't be bankrupt. Oh, yes, they are. When a corporate, when a bank like Continental holds a big mortgage, a big loan to say one of these big factories down here, say they have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan to them. All right, they come in, the management calls in, says we cannot make our payment. We can't even pay the interest. You know how they would fix it? Continental says, well, this is how they got in this mess. They say, well. Tell you what we'll do. We'll make you a new loan to pay the principal. Isn't that cute? So they make them a fresh loan on top of the 250000 to pay the principal that they can't pay. And then when they make up their books, they show that new loan as an as a, as a asset. This is the kind of stupid clowning around that has gone on in the banking trade and every big bank in the country is involved in it. And they are totally insolvent right now. You say, well, what would you do? I'd get it out of there. There are several ways you can go to get out of it. Get your money in something that's not paper. That paper's not any good. You say, that's radicalism. I know. Haven't Christians always been mavericks and radicals? They've never fit in with the society that they've been in because that society's been run by the Antichrist forces. I'm just talking to Christians. These others, let them blow their money. I don't know. Let them, let them go. And you say, well, I don't believe you. Fine. Just stay in there long enough and you'll be wiped out. You'll come in here and say, we just lost our house and our car. All our savings were gone. We thought they were insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Up to $100,000, and we only had 50000 And now they tell us they don't have anything. Congratulations, the light has dawned a little late. You realize this, what is it, about $100 billion worth of bank accounts are insured, and all they've got was, a, what, a billion and a half dollars in the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation? And the Continental alone can wipe that out. It's all paper, people. What am I telling you? Ah! No, get off the panic button. If you're frightened, good. Now maybe you'll listen. There isn't but one way out of this mess. And that's, how, that's by going up. Horizontally, there isn't any trouble. You dig down, you'll be down in the fire. Uh, up is the only way to go. And we're going to have to learn the weapons of our warfare. We're going to have to smarten up, get rid of our ignorance and our stupidity, and start studying what's going on and ask God to give us some intelligence to do with what resources he gives. Otherwise, you're going to be wiped out. One of the ways they're doing it is with credit. 
People are going out of business all over this country. All they need is that little war in Iran and Iraq to rot, rot. They say now, I heard this morning, Iran has 500,000 troops ready to invade Iraq on a massive scale. You know what that's going to mean? The oil shuts down. Next predictable thing, presidential proclamation. Cutting industry back 25% on fuel needs. Civilian needs 75% cut back. That means no gas. Get your walking shoes on. Tell you something else. <laughs> From then on, the service stations start shutting down. Then the restaurants. Then the service things. And we go into a, no, a power dive, into a depression. It's so close until it's breathing down our necks. Now, are you frightened? Good. Then you'll begin to look for, to God because he's the only answer of this thing. Now, if we sit idly by knowing these things are possible and do nothing, we deserve what's coming. If we do everything we can and these other new news let it go down the tube, we can say, well, I did what I could. And I'm still, I've been exercising my spiritual muscles. At least I know how to get things from God and I'm not bankrupt. I may not have much material goods, but I've got, I've got the assets of the Lord and I've learned how to exercise spiritual power. You better learn how to pray to God for healing. When there's no longer going to be any doctors or medicine available. Hmm? We've got to learn how to get things from God. And he wants us to, and if we can't learn any other way, he'll close down everything until we do. You want to wait until he closes everything down? Say, well, now I'm ready to learn. Hmm? Or do you want to join in the battle now? And just when the devil's closing in for the kill, how would you like to see him knocked away from the jugular vein? Have God's strong right arm come down and say, that's enough. Whack! My deliverance people brought down my strong right arm to punch. <laughs> I can hardly wait for the... Deliverance Workshop, I got a couple of sermons on the back burner that I just died to preach. <laughs> but I don't want to spoil it by dumping them ahead of time. One of them is called Wanted, Fire on the Mountain. That's what we need today. And I believe we found, we found some keys and we're dabbling around with it. If we can ever find out where that key is, we're going to have an artesian well, not just a spring flowing in the desert, but an artesian well coming up. That's when, that, that's when the people are going to, like Mary, going to jump out of that wheelchair and run around the building, and I'll join her. That's when, that's when uh, the crooked limbs are going to be made straight, and minds are going to be just suddenly, and nobody's going to say, look at Wynn Worley, look at Haggis. They're going to say, look at Jesus. Wow, isn't he something? You're going to lose sight of people and get sight of Jesus in that day. When that artesian well breaks forth, and it's in deliverance, it's where it's coming through. That's the train that's on. Don't you get sidetracked off into the praise alley. It's not over there. There'd been enough praising to shake the devil off his throne if that would have worked. Nothing wrong with praise. But that's not the power that's going to knock the daylights out of the enemy. It's not evangelism and track passing, although that's great. There's been enough of that done to unseat the devil if that would have done it. There's only one thing that had and healing and miracles. There's been campaigns that just knock your eyeballs out what happened. But that's not the thing to knock the devil off his seat. The thing that'll do it is an army of determined deliverance workers who fear nothing but displeasing Jesus. Why don't you turn around and look over at this verse over here in Isaiah. Read it with me, please. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the weak, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Faith without works is dead. That is the opening blast that Jesus fired when he started his ministry. He hasn't changed his mind. That's the program right there. That's it. It's wrapped up in evangelism, deliverance, and healing. The whole thing is there. 
Everything else is superfluous and supplementary. We must not sacrifice the main drive for the miners. There'll be a lot of other co uh, corollary things. But what has happened over and over again, the major thrust has been lost as minor things take up all the time, energy, and attention. And I'm praying that God is going to make this deliverance thrust so powerful that nobody can miss what's going on in the spirit realm. Now, get out of debt. You don't owe any man anything but to do what? Love one another. If you want to know who the greatest among you is, how do you know? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you build the biggest auditorium in the country. If you fill a stadium full of people and preach like an angel. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have a fleet of buses that can cover the city. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you do this, if you do that, what? If you cast out demons, if you heal the sick. No. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And that starts in the church unit. And it's more important for Hegwood's church people to love each other. And you know, some of you might look and say, well, I don't really care for her. He bothers me. Well, that gives you extra incentive to have to love them, doesn't it? I remember one time in school, we had a young preacher who was very, very conscientious, more than most of us. We were pretty sloppy, some of us. But he was very conscientious. He walked up to one fellow who was a particularly difficult person. I mean, he just always raked everybody the wrong way. And uh, the rest of us just told him. But this fellow was so conscious, he walked up to him very sincerely one day. He said, you know, I find it very difficult in my Christian experience to love you like I ought to. Well, we all knew what he's talking about. You've met people like that, haven't you? You say, yeah, I'm looking at one. Well, don't look my way. <laughs> look at the fellow next to you. We don't need to owe anybody anything except to love one another. For he that loveth another is fulfilled the law. In the beginning of this ministry, God told me, when I was asking him so many questions, I said, but how about this? And what about that? And I couldn't find the trailer. And I looked and looked, and I couldn't find any patterns. And I, how do you do it? Well, what are you supposed to do? There, there no, the rule book didn't have any rules. It had only the very briefest, sketchiest mention of this thing. And, and nobody had written anything that was of any value. And the Lord said, teach them my word. Teach them how to love one another, and I'll show you the rule. For love covereth a multitude of sins, and boy, it does. If you can love, God will get by a lot of other things and take care of them later. That's why you find out a lot of people doing things. You say, well, they're not perfect. They're not holy. I'm holy. Well, it may be that you're just so holy you squeak. Maybe you need greasing or something with some love so you won't make so much noise about your holiness. Did you know that people that are really holy are seldom aware of it? The very, very fact that you have to go around reminding yourself how holy you are is a pretty good indication you're not. These people with their checklist and all, you know, really holy people that you meet are so seldom aware of it. You know what the holy people are really aware of? Is that I sure am a poor example of what God wants. But I'm working on it, Lord. And if you'll just give me time, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm trying. But they don't really have any illusions about themselves. If you read books about great Christians, you'll find out they were on their faces crying about their failures to the Lord. Other people thought they were super giants in the Christian world. They saw themselves through God's eyes and it didn't look that way. That's why I know a lot of people that talk about holiness are not holy at all. They're just Pharisees walking around waving their Pharisees' banners. Line up with me and you'll be holy. Then we can congratulate each other on how much better we are than these other turkeys. They're covered with feathers and we don't even have any. Yeah. Oh, don't get caught in that kind of foolishness. 
Walk with Jesus and let him change your life, your whole attitude. See, a lot of people walk around with a lot of good religious stuff on the outside. They do this and they don't do this, and they do this and they don't do that. But inside they are rotten. Their demons are having a ball. Because they don't have any demons. You don't believe it, ask them. Say, you know what? I believe you have demonic problems. You think I'm demon possessed. I'm under the blood. I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit. I prophesy. Well, that doesn't make any difference. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about what's inside. See, the very fact that the demons are running inside and they don't even know it is a pretty good indication of less than holy. Some of you here who are here at Haglish would have never been able to stay here if you'd have walked into a stiff, holier-than-thou attitude. Well, now I don't know about her. I'll pick on Alice. Who would have picked Alice? Some joyous her. She's her sister. She had to, you know. Poor Alice was just a mess when she came. Weren't we all when we came to Jesus? I pick on Alice because she doesn't mind. She'll get up and tell you and bawl all the time. She's telling about it. What a mess she was. Nobody wanted her. She finally told the Lord, said, well, <laughs> Joyce said, you want me. I don't know what you'd want with me, but if you do, okay. And she went to sleep. She woke up the next morning and something was different. God picked up the option. You give him a chance, he'll pick up the option. He doesn't mind how messed up it is, people. He specializes in mess up people. That's the only kind he deals with. So are you going to cry, Alice? Oh, for goodness sake, I set her off. That's the way she does every time she gets thinking about it. Well, you know, if you saved out as much hell as she was, you'd bawl every time you thought about it too. Amen. Put your hands up and praise the Lord, Alice. <laughs> All right. And there's, a, there's dozens of others sitting out here. I'm just picking on her because she's down here handy. But there's, you know, none of us have anything to brag about, do we? Law, me goodness. Whether you were starched and iron without being washed and sliding to hell from a church pew, whether you're down in the gutter walling around with the pigs, it doesn't make any difference. Sin is sin, and God said, I've concluded them all, and they're all rotten. All your righteousness is as filthy rags, so all you starched and iron won't slide down in the gutter with the rest of them if you think you're better than. Now, he said, now I'll pick mine out of the gutter. Oh, yeah, a church member down there too, huh? Okay, all the same. He's concluded all under sin so that he might extend mercy to everybody. Hallelujah. From guttermost to uttermost. I'm so glad he saves completely, aren't you? And I'm glad he doesn't stop when he gets born again. He, he's got more. Much, much more. That just begins the operation to get you ready for heaven. Thank God. You're ready for heaven right away as far as going there, but oh, there's so much more that God can do you with your life before you go up there. Amen. Did you ever sit around and say, oh, Lord, take me to heaven? Well, it's not likely he will yet. He's working on some projects. You could go to heaven, but you wouldn't receive the rewards and things he's got blocked out for you. He, you wouldn't get all the good things he's planned for you. He wants you to have those things. Praise the Lord. Well, he said, uh, thou hast fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit the adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Not covet, if there are any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor thyself. He said, if you keep that commandment, you'll keep the rest of them. You won't steal from somebody you love. You're not going to uh, violate somebody that you love. And when love, see, that's why love is so critical. When love is really perfected in you and in me, then we'll automatically be keeping the rest of this stuff. Now, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. And that knowing the time, now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Wake up! That's what he said. Yeah, that got a few of them that was nodding a bit. All right. Wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. We're closer to salvation now than we were when we first believed. We had a dear lady who used to come out here uh, to Hagar to the old church sometimes. She was, uh, she'd been a drug addict, prostitute down on the streets of Chicago for many, many years and got saved and just went crazy for the Lord. 
and she'd stand up and sing with a little auto harp, and she had a song she sang, I'm nearer home than I was yesterday. And she'd just sing and sing, bless you so. But that dear sister, <coughs> she knew that the days were coming closer when she's going home to be with Jesus, and she's looking forward to it. Praise the Lord. Well, our salvation's nearer than when we believe. You know, salvation is more than just being born again. Did you know that? Being born again just secures everything. And But did you know salvation includes a new body? Have you got that yet? Hmm? No, but it's bought. Bought and paid for. It's there. Uh, salvation bought you a home in heaven. Have you been through it yet? Oh, you haven't? Well, you got one. Uh, salvation bought you deliverance from evil spirits. Have you cashed that one yet? Say, well, I cashed a few. Well, this and more. You can cash every one of those things in and get rid of those wicked things. Because salvation paid for you. Salvation paid for our healing. Salvation paid for our deliverance. Salvation paid for a victorious walk. You say, well, I don't have it. I don't know what's the matter. Not my fault. Well, if you have that attitude, it probably is mostly your fault. Well, other people are getting it and I'm not. Well, there's something wrong. If you're in a place where hundreds of people are getting a blessing, you're the only one left out, then either God's a liar or else he's playing favorites. Now, if you were going to a place where nobody was getting any help, you'd say, well, see, I'm just like the rest of them. Nobody's getting any help much here once in a while. But if you're in a place where hundreds of people are getting help using these things, I've had people come up to me and I said, well, I didn't get delivered. I said, now look. I said, the workers are all using the same methods. I said, that same crew delivered some other people, had similar problems to yours. Now, where do you think the problem may lay? I said, it's true. Workers can be off kilter a little bit and be out of focus, but not when you've gone through two or three crews workers. They're all working the same way. I said, they went on to another set of uh, workers and they got delivered real fine. I said, start looking for some answers inside yourself. And don't go on a guilt trip. Just say, hey, Lord, there's something hidden in here. I knew what it was. I'm honest enough to say, here it is. Let's get it out. So it must be hidden even from me. Now, Lord, show me where that scatterwag's hidden the, hidden the key to this thing. There's a key to every demon. You say, well, how do you find it? Well, you try every key you've got. If I, if I was in a room with a door and I had a handful of keys and a whole bunch of doors, you say, well, which key fits what? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to try every key i got. And, you know, some of those keys are skeleton keys. They'll fit more than one. <clears throat> Try that key on every door you come to. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom how to do it. You see, people are too afraid to try something. In deliverance, one good thing about it, when you try it, if it doesn't work, it's not going to hurt anything. People come up and say, well, will it hurt for me to break curses over so-and-so? I said, it doesn't, couldn't hurt a thing. I said, the worst thing could happen, it wouldn't, nothing would happen. I said, it's not going to hurt anything. And I said, if, if, it, if it does, it's going to take you a couple of minutes to do it. And I said, if it works, you're way ahead. I said, try it. If God put it on your heart to try it, try it. It's not going to hurt anything. You, can, you say, well, uh, you suppose so-and-so's in there? Well, I said, well, call it out and see. Peck away at it. It's not going to hurt anything if you shoot and miss. Did you ever go, uh, go out hunting birds? Did you hit every bird you shot at? Or you say, well, I, I want to wait and be sure that I can hit it before I shoot. I'd hate to waste a shot. You know, I don't have but 500 BBs here, and I'd hate to, you know. I know, you shoot, shoot until you hit something, right? And that's the way you are in deliverance. I mean, shoot, try it. You don't hurt anything. I find people are just so scared, you know. They say, oh, I'm so afraid I'll do something wrong. Well, they're not going to die on the operating table. One reason that we, lie, we have deliverance here in the church facility is because we have the access then to all of the believers' talents, their abilities, their knowledge, their spiritual power, and everything else is all channeled into one spot. And if somebody gets hung up or gets stuck, they can always get help. In a deliverance situation, you don't have a star system. Nobody's the star. Everybody's a worker. Some have been at it a little longer, may know a few things others don't know. But if you get stuck, there's no, no, uh, there's no stigma in saying, I don't know what to do now. You don't say, well, I don't know what to do, but I'm not going to tell anybody. 
because nobody looks down on you because everybody's learning and it's a team effort and when I tell you when they get make the touchdown every the whole team's gonna go crazy shout I mean when the demons come out even the people that had nothing to do with it they pray to somebody else they're gonna turn and say well praise the Lord look at them Isn't that great you know it's not something you're competing with one another. Now, I, I cast out 17 demons. How many did you cast? Oh, you only cast out 15? Well, maybe you'll catch up. I mean, you know, it's, it's not some kind of competition we're running trying to catch up with one another. We're busy trying to get the body of Christ back on its feet, walking with Jesus. Everybody you deliver is a potential demon-hater soldier. And the more of those we can turn loose on the devil, the better off it is. And that's why he hates delivering so. Because once you get free and get your guns loaded, then you'll go after them too. Praise the Lord. So if you're, if you're sitting up on uh, Do Nothing Mountain and, and uh, rocking and I'm sorry for myself, poor me. If you got the poor me's, come out of them. Start ministering to somebody else. You say, I don't feel like it. Well, do it anyhow. Do it because it's right. Did you ever do something because you had it because it was supposed to be done? Wouldn't it be awful if you waited until you felt like doing everything you wanted to do? I don't know how many times I've been, I'd be sitting back there and often I don't feel like preaching this morning. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a note come out here and the preacher says he doesn't feel like preaching, church dismissed. <laughs> You do what's right because it's right. And it's amazing how quickly you get to feeling like it after you do it. If, you, if, you get, if you're going by your feelings, the devil will play games with you on that. Oh, he'll say, boy, here's a, here's a new new. <laughs> All you have to do is make her feel down. She won't even go to church. <laughs> well, hear what that stupid preacher has to say. All you have to do is knock him down and get him to feel sorry for himself. He won't even, he won't even drag in drag in when you don't feel like it when you're half mad some people say well in the mood I'm in I don't need to be in church I just mess it up and the demons say that's right that's right stay home <laughs> now in the mood you're in you need to go to church worse than you ever did when you was feeling hallelujah happy I mean you need to go there you come into church have you sometimes in the objective case in the kickative mood Somebody say, hi. You think, hi. Stupid fool. They felt as bad as I did. They wouldn't be running around and grinning all over their face. Somebody say, hi there. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> what an idiot. If you had all my problems, you wouldn't be. Anybody ever come in like that? No hands, please. Well, I've seen some of you. That's when I come up and I say, Hi there! You must have had a great week. You look great. <laughs> you talk about acting, it has to come off then, I'll tell you, because you have to really... No, but the shock treatment is the best way to get people out of that kind of thing. See, I just shocked most of you out of your sleepiness. Now you're all alert and awake. Oh, listen, the night's far spent. The day is at hand. I believe the day of deliverance is coming. I may be mistaken. I may not live to see it, but I think I will. I believe that blinding light is going to come so quick and so fast until it's going to shock the living daylights out of everybody, the devil included. I mean, it's going to take off one of these days. See, we're just laying the groundwork now. Do you realize, until this church had been thrown into gear and had, been, had all these, the marvelous things that God has poured out by the Holy Spirit on this body and then caused other people across the country to catch fire and start feeding in information they're getting because they're gone into the battle now and they're learning and they're feeding back bits of information to us and we've had the joy of putting it together and compiling it and seeing how it works. Do you realize that all across the country there are little fires burning and the devil's got more fires on his coattail than he can handle? 
And he, he goes swatting one out and, and three break out over here while he's swatting over here. And he, he knocks down some, but there's a bunch of others popping up. And did you know that until those seven books were compiled, there was no workable textbooks anywhere to tell people how to do deliverance. War on the Saints was written during the Welsh Revival, has invaluable material in it, but tells you very little about how to get the demons out. Just says, take the ground away from them. That sounds good, but if you try that and they still hold on, what do you do then? Well, they don't have an answer, you see. Some of the others, earlier books on deliverance, wrote and diagnosed the thing and showed what was happening and even talked about casting demons out, but very little about how do you do it. And God gave us the keys and he put a practical old Scots preacher at the typewriter saying, because I have to have everything written out, spelled out in easy to understand language or I can't figure it out. So I put it down the way I understood and I found out a lot of other simpletons around the country because when they picked up the book said, oh, I can understand that. Yeah, I can do that. And they started doing it and it worked. The beautiful thing about the books is that they're not the product of Win Werner, they're the product of what the Holy Spirit has done in this church. I just happen to be the recorder. And God put it in such a plain, simple way that ordinary believers can pick up the same things and do them in California, Florida, Hawaii, Indonesia, or wherever, and the same things will happen. Because the principles are valid and biblical and they will work. And to me, this is the most exciting thing about the books, is the fact that those principles will work for any believer anywhere. And it's going to be such a glory when we get to heaven. And there are people who have testimonies in those books, and people are going to, up in heaven are going to make a run for you when you get through those gates up there. They're going to run, hug your neck, and they say, you say, oh, praise the Lord, you're finally here. Oh, thank God. And you think, well, <laughs> I don't believe I know you. And they say, oh, no, you don't know me, but I've been waiting for you to get here. I know you because I read your testimony and that's what gave me hope. I didn't commit suicide. I didn't kill myself, kill my kids. When I read that testimony, I thought there is hope and I got help and I got saved and oh my, I get all excited. I almost get anxious to go home, you know. Let's hurry up, you know. Let's get this thing over with. But you see, all of it's not out yet. It's like, a, like rocks in the water, you know. And then the ripples start and all the ripples haven't stopped yet. Every one of those things you throw out spread on the water, it starts ripples, and they're producing, it's producing results. And as we give it added power with prayer, because we know the night's far spent and the day is coming, I want to see the day of deliverance, don't you? I want to see these humanists dumped out of their saddles. I'd like to see those humanists get on the floor and get rid of those things. Amen? And... Uh, I'd even like to see some of the sons of God manifest so we get that out of them. <laughs> so they quit being holy and start delivering people. I just, I just want to see God's people set free. And you say, well, how do I know that? Well, I don't know how to prove it to you. Except the books, the meetings across the country and where God has opened up works where they couldn't be in works. And where I, I got a call the other night, this man and his wife said, well, it's just me and my wife, but said, we have deliverance every week. Said, people are still coming in. And when you get those books and you get started studying them, this is the testimony. Without anybody telling anybody anything, God starts sending people in. That's how short workers are. Once people get hold of those books, then the people, the flood of people starts coming in on them. In Jakarta, when they got home and word was noised about they'd been to a deliverance church, People poured in every night. That's why we're going over to help them in June. Every night in that home, those business people are holding sessions. Study sessions, video sessions, tape sessions, and deliverance sessions. And they just came here to get some deliverance themselves. And they say, we're following the books and the Holy Spirit and the demons are coming out. Praise the Lord. Isn't that encouraging? That means you don't have to sell your house, sell your car, and go to Bible school. That means you have to learn a few basic principles and have guts and determination to stand up and spit in the devil's eye and go after him. Now the devil's a big bluff. Those demons will run, but you've got to put steam on them. 
And praise the Lord. When you're backed up by a church like this, you can't help but steam them a little. <laughs> but we still have things we haven't been able to crack. We still have cases we, we, we have to say, turn away sadly and say, I don't know what to do. Don't know what to tell you other than bind and loose. And I believe this year, God ought to give us one or two more tremendous breakthroughs as big as sins of the fathers and the fragments of the soul. I've been praying, God, give it to us somewhere. Let some deliverance worker somewhere stumble into it. And let's find out about it so we can get further down the road faster and destroy the works of the devil more efficiently than we've learned so far. He said, let us put on the armor of light. If we're going to walk in this battle, we've got to be armored. Because I'll tell you one thing, it's not easy. It'll be the hardest thing you ever tried to do. And if you're a sissy, don't even start. Any old dead fish can float downstream with the tide. It takes a live one to swim upstream against the current. A bunch of old dead fish cluttering up the ways. They're just drifting down with the tide. This is whichever way the crowd goes, that's the way they're going. But if you've got more to you than that, praise the Lord. Start swimming upstream. Put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and Indian. Oh, boy. We're not in competition with anybody. But we won't put up with error. And we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna muzzle ourselves and play Pollyanna and say everything is wonderful. Isn't it glorious? Well we better not say anything because it might offend our religious friends. If it offends them, that's tough. Move into a position of biblical sureness, then you won't be offended. I mean, if it offends uh, people to say the Catholic Church is in idolatry, well then let the Catholic Church forsake idolatry. If it offends uh, people to say that the occult is of the devil, then uh, let them forsake it. Then they won't be offended anymore. Any of those things that offend God, we need to stand with him. Let us walk honestly as in the day, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of the strong desires thereof. That's what God wants. He wants people dedicated, committed to him, not the devil. How long does it take for him to make a Christian? Depends on how fast that Christian wants to make. You say, well, you know, I just am in a bunch, you know, and they, uh, these Christians, they bother me, and they're not holy, and they're not righteous, and, and here I am so righteous, and I'm exposed to all these unrighteous people. Oh, they're born again, but they're just not what they ought to be. Well, you know, diamonds are little chunks of coal, you know. And when you see a diamond in the rough, it is the, it's the ugly. So it looks like an old broken piece of glass or something. Ugly, got all kinds of spots and flaws on it. And you know what it takes to cut a diamond? Diamonds are so hard, nothing can cut them except another diamond. So guess what? <laughs> God gathers up a bunch of diamonds in the rough that got all kinds of flaws and bumps on them. He throws them all together in a church, and they and then he starts it tumbling, <laughs> round and round. You know, I think he must stand and chuckle a little bit when. She bothers me. Oh, I don't like him. <laughs> and we just rub each other, you know, the wrong way, and we just have to get, well, I know I don't love him, but ooh, oh, she bothers me every time she comes around. He, he annoys me so. You know what's happening? Those little irritations are flaws in us, usually. Isn't that disgusting? It's so much easier if it was them. They're the ones. I'm sweet, I'm holy, I'm righteous. Just like some of the gals that started out to decide to pray for their husbands because they were unrighteous. And guess what? God started to full overhaul on them. One lady, as one lady said, said, Lord, it's not me, it's him. You know, he, he's not even saved. You, 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 you know, I'm all right. I want all the right things. He's the turkey, you know. Pluck him. And said, the more she prayed, prayed about that, the more she, he, he went after her. And it changed her. Be careful what you pray for. You get what you ask for. But it doesn't come down the road you thought it was sometimes. And of course, you all know my story about the patience. You say, oh, Lord, 
I read that you want us to be patient, and Lord, I need it. Oh, send me patience. The Lord is so faithful. Within the hour, almost within the hour, a great big dump truck of, of tribulation and trouble back up and dump right in your yard. You'll say, get away, I didn't order that. I don't want that. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's this address. This is where it's supposed to be delivered. But I don't want it. See, you ordered the finished product. God sent the raw material. That's what he always does. You pray for patience, he sends tribulation. Because tribulation worketh patience. I wish that wasn't so. I hate that every time the Lord makes me say that. Because then the next time, then the next time I get irritable... The Lord said, tribulation works face. I, I feel like saying, hush, hush, I don't want to hear it. Not now. How can I stay mad if I know what's causing it? Hmm? What a glorious God we serve. And people, we're on the brink of disaster and on the brink of glory. Now, if you look at disaster, it'll get you all down. Ooh. If you look at the glory that's possible, you think, well... It's worth fighting for. Is it worth fighting for? Well, if it's not, go jump over the brink. If it's worth fighting for, arm yourself. If you're here this morning, you've never asked Jesus in your heart, would you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, woman, boy, girl, hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to? You could pray something like this, Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now, come into my heart, save me from all my sins. Now, if you've never really done it before, he'll come in. If you have already, he'll tell you why you're confused. You say, suppose I do that though and I still feel the same. I'm still uncertain. I'm still fearful. I'm still, uh, I'm still upset. Well, then come forward and tell one of the workers who'll be up here at the front, say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. Somebody will sit down with the Word of God, go over the plan of salvation, and see if that's what you're believing, what you're leaning on. If it is, then you can know because of God's Word that you're saved. And you can go on from there. If you're not on God's plan of salvation, you can get on it this morning. You can't lose that way, can you? Now, supposing that's not your problem, you say, well, I know I'm saved, but I'm sure I'm disgusted. I'm sick and tired of the way I am. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I just get tired of it. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, you're pretty close to hell. That's the kind of people hang. You know, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and then hang on. God will be along pretty quick. He's waiting for you to run out of answers. He's waiting for you to run out of solutions. Then he'll come along and do something for you. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. If you're being harassed, driven, tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, it slows down, stops, or reverses your spiritual growth and progress. This is how demons operate. This is why we throw them out. Because Jesus said this is one of the signs that follows believers. And if you have these kind of problems, or you think you do, come and just say, I think I need deliverance. And we've got a worker with you right away to help you with these areas of problem. No big deal. We'll just get somebody to start praying with you and to help you. And uh, another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you have not received this gift from the Lord since you believe, and it is a gift, then we'd encourage you to indeed receive this gift this morning. Somebody here could help you to understand it and even pray for you to receive it if you're interested. Another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And if you have physical needs, of course, come. There are people who believe that Jesus heals today and will lay hands on you and pray with you in Jesus' name for your healing, for physical needs. Let's stand, sing something about that.